Awakened Imagination by Neville Goddard, read by Aidan AVO, originally published in 1954. This is a copyrighted recording production of Centuries of Wisdom for the purpose of research, study, discussion, and enjoyment. The views and opinions expressed in this book by the author Neville Goddard may not always reflect those of Centuries of Wisdom or its affiliates. I hope that you truly enjoy this presentation and receive a lot from it. Hello, everyone. Before getting into Awakened Imagination, I just want to let you guys know I received a lot from this book, so much so that I wanted to come on and record this book for myself. I really enjoyed the way that Neville Goddard streams his ideas on imagination and then compares it to verses in the Bible and passages. For me, it clarifies those passages a lot more and makes a lot more sense. I received a lot from this short book, a lot of practical applications and timeless information. So take care, much love. Hope you guys truly enjoy this presentation and take a lot from it that you can use in your daily life as well. Chapter one, who is your imagination? I rest not from my great task to open the internal worlds, to open the immortal eyes of man inwards into the worlds of thought, into eternity, the ever expanding bosom of God, the human imagination. Blake, Jerusalem, 5, 18 through 20. Certain words in the course of long use gather such strange connotations that they almost cease to mean anything at all. Such a word is imagination. This word is made to serve all manners of ideas. Some are directly opposite to one another, such as fancy, thought, hallucination, suspicion, indeed. So wide in its use and variety of meanings, the word imagination almost has no status nor significance. For example, we ask a man to use his imagination, meaning that his present outlook is too restrictive and therefore not equal to the task. But in the next breath, we tell him that his ideas are pure imagination, thereby implying that his ideas are unsound. We speak of a jealous or suspicious person as a victim of their own imagination. Then a minute later, we pay a man the highest tribute by describing him the man of imagination. Thus, the word imagination has no definite meaning. Even the dictionary gives us no help. It defines imagination as one, the picturing power of an active mind, the constructive or creative principle, two, a phantasm, three, an irrational notion or belief, four, planning, plotting, or scheming as an involvement in mental construction. For me, I identify the central figure of the gospel with human imagination, the power which makes forgiveness of sin, the achievement of goals inevitable. John 1, 3, all things were made by him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. There is only one thing in the world, imagination, in all our formations of it. Isaiah 53, 3. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Imagination is the very gateway of reality. Man is either the ark of God or a phantom of the earth, of water. Naturally, he is only a natural organ subject to sense. The eternal body of man is the imagination that God is himself, the divine body. We are his members, William Blake. I know of no greater nor truer definition of the imagination than that of William Blake. By imagination, we have the power to be anything we desire. Through imagination, we disarm and transform the violence of the world. Our most intimate as well as our most casual relationships become imaginative as we awaken the mysteries hidden from the ages that Christ is us in our imagination. We then realize that only as we live by imagination can we truly be said to live at all. I want this book to be the simplest, clearest, frankest work I have the power to make. That I may encourage you to function imaginatively. That you may open your immortal eyes inwards into the worlds of thought. John 10.10 10, I come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. The abundant life that Christ promised us is our experience now but not until we have the sense of Christ, as our imagination can experience it. The mystery hidden from the ages is that Christ is in you, your imagination. This is the mystery which I am ever striving to realize more keenly myself to urge upon others. Colossians 1 27, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is not disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of the mystery which is Christ is in you, the hope of glory. Imagination is our Redeemer, the Lord from heaven, born of a man, but not begotten by man. If the story of the Immaculate Conception and birth of Christ appears irrational to man, it is only because it is misread as a biography, history, or cosmology. Modern explorers of imagination don't help by calling it the unconscious or subconscious mind. 
Imagination's birth and growth is a gradual transition from a God of tradition to a God of experience. If the birth of Christ in man seems slow, it is only because man is unwilling to let go the comfortable and false anchorage of tradition. Isaiah 28, 16. Romans 9, 33. When imagination is discovered as the first principle of religion, the stone of literal understanding will have felt like the rod of Moses and like the rod of Zion. Issue forth the water of psychology, meaning to quench the thirst of humanity. And all who take the cup and live a life according to the truth will transform the water of the psychological meaning into the wine of forgiveness. The Son of God cannot be found in history nor in any external form. He can only be found as the imagination of him within us, in whom his presence becomes manifested in us. Man is the garden by which his only begotten son sleeps. He awakens the sun by lifting up his imagination into the heavens and clothing men like godlike statues. We must go on imagining better than the best we know. Man in the moment of his awakening to the imaginative life must meet the test of sonship. Galatians 1 15, 16 Father, reveal thy son in me, and it pleased God to reveal thy son in me. The supreme test of sonship is the forgiveness of sin. The test that your imagination is Christ Jesus, the Son of God, is your ability to forgive sin. Sin means missing one's mark in life, falling short of one's ideal, failing to achieve one's aim. Forgiveness means identification of man with his ideal aim in life. This is the work of awakened imagination, the supreme work for it tests man's ability to enter into it and partake into the nature of the opposite. Joel 3.10 Let the weak man say I'm strong. Reasonably, it's impossible. Only awakened imagination can enter and partake into the opposite nature. This conception of Jesus Christ as human imagination raises the fundamental question, is imagination as a power sufficient? not merely enabling me to be as strong as I am, but is it also itself capable of executing the idea? Suppose that I desire to be some place or some situation. Could I, by imagining myself into such a state or place, bring about the physical realization? Suppose I could not afford the journey, and suppose my present social and financial status is opposite of the idea I want to realize. Would imagination be sufficient in itself to incarnate these desires? Does imagination comprehend reason? By reason, I mean deductions from the observation of the senses. Does it recognize the external world of facts? In a particular way of everyday life, is imagination a complete guide to behavior? Suppose I am capable of acting with continuous imagination. That is, suppose I am capable of sustaining the feeling of my wish fulfilled. Will my assumption harden into fact? And if it does not harden into fact, shall I on reflections find that my actions through the period of incubation have not been reasonable? Is my imagination a power sufficient, not merely to assume that the feeling of the wish fulfilled, but is also itself capable of incarnating the idea? After assuming I am already where I want to be, must I continually guide myself with reasonable ideas and actions in order to bring out the most fulfillment of my assumption? Experience has convinced me that an assumption though false, if persisted in, will harden in fact. This continuous imagination is sufficient for all things, and all of my reasonable plans and actions will never make up for my lack of continuous imagination. It is not true that the teachings of the gospel can only be received in terms of faith, and that the Son of God is constantly looking for signs of faith in people, that is, faith in their own imagination. That is not the promise. Mark eleven twenty four. Believe that ye receive, and ye shall receive. The same as imagine that you are, and you shall be. Hebrews eleven twenty seven. Was it not an imaginary state in which Moses endured, seeing him who is invisible? Truth depends on the intensity of imagination, and not on external facts. Facts are the fruits bearing witness of those use or misuse of imagination. Facts are the fruits bearing witness to the use or misuse of imagination. The truth depends on the intensity of imagination and not upon external facts. Facts are the fruits bearing witness of the use or misuse of imagination. Man becomes what he imagines. He has a self-determined history. Imagination is the way the truth in the life revealed. We cannot get a hold of truth with the logical mind. We cannot get a hold of truth with the logical mind. Where the natural man of sense sees a bud, 
imagination sees a full-blown rose. Truth cannot be encompassed by fact. As we awaken to imaginative life, we discover that to imagine a thing is to make it so. That a true judgment need not conform to the external reality to which it relates. The imaginative man does not deny the reality or the senses of the outer world while it's becoming. He knows that there is an inner world of continuous imagination that is the force by which the senses of the outer world become and is brought to pass. He sees the outer world and all that's happening as a projection of the inner world of imagination. To him, everything is a manifestation of mental activity, which goes on in a man's imagination. He realizes that every man must be conscious of the inner activity and see the relationship between the inner world of the imagination and the senses of the outer world and its effects. It is a marvelous thing to find that you can imagine yourself into a state of fulfilled desire and escape the jails which ignorance builds. The real man is a magnificent imagination. It is this self that must be awakened. Ephesians 5.14 awake, awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. The moment man discovers that Christ, the moment that man discovers his imagination is Christ, he accomplishes acts on which this level can only be called miraculous. But until man has a sense of Christ as his imagination, he will see everything in pure objectivity without subjective relationship. John 15, 16, you did not choose me, I have chosen you. Not realizing that all that he encounters is a part of himself, he rebels at the thought that he has chosen the conditions of his life, that they are related by affinity to his own mental activity. Man must firmly come to believe that the reality lies within him and not without him. Although others have bodies, a life of their own, their reality is rooted in you, ends in you, and yours ends in God. Chapter 2, Sealed Instructions The first power that meets us at the threshold of a soul's dominion is the power of imagination. Dr. Francis Hartman I was first made conscious of the power of nature and the redemptive function of imagination through the teachings of my friend Abdul. And through subsequent experiences, I have learned that Jesus was the symbol of the coming of imagination to man. That the test of his birth in man is the individual's ability to forgive sin. That is, the ability to identify himself or another with his aim in life. Without the identification of man with his aim, the forgiveness of sin is an impossibility, and only the Son of God can forgive. Therefore, man's ability to identify himself with this aim, though reason in his senses deny it, is proof of Jesus Christ in him. To passively surrender to appearance and bow before the evidence of fact is so confess that Christ is yet born in you. Although this teaching shocked and repelled me at first, for I was convinced as an earnest Christian and did not then know that Christianity could not be inherited by mere accident of birth, but must be consciously accepted and adopted as a way of life. It stole later on through visions, mystical revelations, practical experiences into my understanding, and I found its interpretation deeper in mood. But I must confess that it was a trying time when those things are shaken which one has already taken for granted. No one stone of literal understanding will be left after one drinks the water of psychological meaning. Mark 13, 2. See that those great buildings? There shall not be one left, one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. All that has, all that has been built up by religion is cast into flames of mental fire. Yet by, yet what better way to understand Christ Jesus than to identify the central character of the gospel with human imagination, knowing that every time you exercise your imagination lovingly on the behalf of another, you are literally meditating to God and thereby feeding and clothing Jesus Christ. And that whenever you imagine evil against another, you are literally beating and crucifying Jesus. Every imagination of man is either the cup of cold water or the sponge of vinegar to a parched lips of Christ. Zechariah 8.17 Let none of you imagine evil in your hearts against your neighbor, warned the prophet. John 1.10 When man heeds the advice, he will awake from the imposed sleep of Adam into the full consciousness of the Son of God. He is in the world, and the world is made by him. 
and the world knows not him. This is human imagination. I ask myself many times, if my imagination is Jesus Christ and all things are possible through Jesus Christ, are all things possible to me? Through experience, I have come to know that when I identify myself with my aim in life, then Christ is awake in me. Christ is sufficient for all things. Christ is sufficient for all things. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. My grace is sufficient for thee. Colossians 2, 9, 10. For in him dwell the fullness of the godly body. All are complete in him, which is the head of principality and power. John 10, 17, 18. No man taketh for, no man taketh for me, but I lay it down of myself. What a comfort is it to know that all that I experience is the result of my own standards of my belief, that I am the center of my own web of circumstances, and that I change so must the outer world. The world presents different appearances according to our state of consciousness. What we see when we are identified with the state cannot be seen when we are no longer infused with it. By state is meant all the men believes and consents it to be true. No idea present to the mind can realize itself unless the mind accepts it. It depends on the acceptance, the state in which we are identified, how things present themselves. In the fusion of imagination and the states, it can be found that the shaping of the world as it seems. The world is a revelation of states with which imagination is fused. It is the state from which we think that determines the objective world in which we live. The rich man, the poor man, the good man, the thief, are all what they are by virtue of the state from which they view the world. On the distinction between these states depends the distinction between the worlds of these men. Individually so different is the same world. It is not the actions and the behavior of the good man that shall be a match by this point. Individually so different in the same world. It is not the actions and behavior of the good man that shall be matched to this point of view. Outer reforms are useless if the inner state is not changed. Success is gained not by intimidating the outer actions of the successful, but by the right inner actions and inner talking. If we detach ourselves from a state, and we may at any moment, the conditions and circumstances to which the Union gave will be vanished. It was in fall of 1933 in New York City that I approached Abdul with a problem. He asked me one simple question, what do you want? I told him that, I want to spend the I told him that I want to spend the winter in Barbados, but I was broke. I literally did not have a nickel. He said, If you imagine yourself in Barbados, if you will imagine yourself to be in Barbados, he said, thinking and viewing the world from the state of consciousness instead of thinking of Barbados, you will spend the winter there. You must not concern yourself with the ways and means of getting there, for the state of consciousness of already being in Barbados if occupied by your imagination, it will devise the means best suited to realize itself. Man lives by committing himself to invisible states, by fusing his imagination with what he knows to be other than himself. And in this union, he experiences the result of that fusion. No one can lose what he has, save by the detachment from the state where the things experienced have their natural life. You must imagine yourself right in the state of your fulfilled desire, Abdul told me and fall asleep viewing the world from Barbados. The world which we describe from observation must be as we describe it relative to ourself. Our imagination connects us with the state desired. But we must use our imagination masterfully, not as an onlooker thinking on the end, but as a partaker thinking from the end. We must actually be there in imagination. If we do this, our subjective experience will be realized objectively. This is not mere fancy, he said, but a truth you can prove by experience. His appeal to enter into wish fulfilled was the secret of thinking from the end. Every state is already there as mere possibility, as long as you think of it. But it's overpoweringly real when you think from it. Thinking from the end is the way of Christ. And I began right there, fixing my thoughts beyond the limits of senses, beyond that aspect to which my present state gave me being. Towards the feeling already being in the Barbados and viewing the world from that standpoint, he, emph he emphasized the importance of the state from which the man views the world as he falls asleep. All prophets claim that the voice of God is chiefly heard by man in their dreams. 
in a dream, in a vision. Job 33, 15, 16. In a dream, in the vision of the night, when deep sleep fallen upon men in the slumbering of the mind, then he opens the ears of men and seals their instructions within them. That night for several nights thereafter, I fell asleep in the assumption that I was in my father's house in Barbados. Within a month, I received a letter from our brother saying that he had a strong desire to have the family together at Christmas and asked me to enclose the steamship ticket for Barbados. I sailed two days after I received my brother's letter and spent the wonderful winter in Barbados. This experience convinced me that man can be anything he pleases if they make the conception habitual from the end. It also shown me that I can no longer excuse myself by placing blame on the world of external things, that my good and my evil have no discrepancies within myself, that it depends on the state from which I view the world, how things present themselves. Man who is free in his choice acts from conceptions which he freely, though not always, wisely chooses. All conceivable states are awaiting our choice and occupancy, but no amount of rationalization will of itself yield us the state of consciousness, which is the only thing worth having. The imaginative image is the only thing to seek. The ultimate purpose of imagination is to create in us the spirit of Jesus, which is continually forgiving of sin, continually identification of man and his ideal. Only by identifying ourself with our aim can we forgive ourselves for having missed it. All else is labor in vain. On this path, whatever place or state we convey our imagination, to that place or state we gravitate physically also. In my father's house are so many mansions. John 14, 2, 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. By sleeping in my father's house in my imagination, as I slept there in the flesh, fused my imagination with the state, and I was compelled to experience that state in the flesh also. So vivid was that state to me. I could have been seen in my father's house, had sensitivity enter the room where in imagination I would be sleeping. A man can be seen where his imagination is, for a man must be where his imagination is, for his imagination is himself. This I know from experience, for I have been seen by a few to whom I desired to be seen, when physically I was hundreds of miles away. I, by the intensity of my imagination and feeling, imagining and feeling myself to be in Barbados instead of merely thinking of Barbados, had spanned the vast Atlantic to influence my brother into desiring my presence to complete the family circle at Christmas. Thinking from the end, from the feeling of my wish fulfilled, was the source of everything that happened as outer cause. Such as my brother's impulse to send me the steamship ticket, and it was all because everything that appeared as a result. D in Ideas of Good and Evil, W.B. Yeats, having described a few experiences similar to this one of mine, writes, If all who described events like this have not dreamed, we shall rewrite our histories for all men, certainly all imaginative men, must be forever chasing forth enchantments, glamour, illusions, and all men, especially tranquil men, who have no power, egotistical life, must be continually passing under their power. Determined imagination, thinking from the end, is the beginning of all miracles. I would like to give you an immense belief in miracles, but a miracle is only the name given by those who have no knowledge of the power and function to the works of imagination. Imagining oneself into the feeling of the wish fulfilled is the means by which a new state is entered. This gives the state the quality of isness. Hermes tells us that that which is is manifested, that which has been or shall be is unmanifested, but not dead, for the soul's eternal activity of God animates all things. The future must become the present in the imagination of the one who would wisely and consciously create circumstances. We must translate vision into being, thinking of into thinking from. Imagination must center itself in some state and view the world from that state. Thinking from the end is the intense perception of the world of fulfilled desire. Thinking from the state desired is creative living. Ignorance of this ability to think from the end is bondage. It is the root of all bondage by which man is bound. 
To passively surrender to the evidence of the senses underestimates the capacities of the inner self. Once man accepts thinking from the end as a creative principle in which he can cooperate, he is then redeemed from the absurdity of ever having to attempt to achieve his objective by merely thinking of it. Construct all ends according to the pattern of the fulfilled desire. The whole of life is just the appeasement of hunger. In the infinite states of consciousness from which a man can view the world are purely a means of satisfying that hunger. The principle upon which each state is organized is some form of hunger to lift the passion of self-gratification to higher and higher levels of experience. The desire is the mainstring of mental machinery. It is a blessed thing. It is a right and natural craving which has a state of consciousness as it is a right and natural satisfaction. Philippines 3, 13, 14. I do, forgetting the things which are behind and stretching forward to these things which are before, I press on towards the goal. It is necessary to have an aim in life. Without an aim we drift. Luke 18, 41. What wantest thou of me? This is an applied question asked most often by the central figures of the gospel. In defining your aim, you must want it. It is his lack of passion and direction to life that make man fail in his accomplishments. The spanning of the bridge between desire, thinking of, and satisfaction, thinking from, it is all important. We must move mentally from thinking of the end to thinking from the end. This reason could never do. By its nature, it is restricted to the evidence of the senses, but imagination having no such limit can. Desire exists to be gratified in the activity of imagination. Through imagination, man escapes from the limitations of the senses and the bondage of reason. There is no stopping the man who could think from the end. Nothing can stop him. He creates the means and grows out of his limitations into an ever greater mansion in the Lord. It does not matter what he has been or what he is. All that matters is what does he want. He knows the world is a manifestation of his mental activity which goes on without himself, so he strives to determine and control the ends from which he thinks. In his imagination he dwells in the end, confident that he shall dwell there in the flesh also. He puts his whole trust in the feeling of the wish fulfilled and lives by committing himself to that state, for the art of fortune is tempting him to do so. Like the man at the pool of Bethesda, he is ready for the moving of the waters of imagination knowing that every desire is a ripe grain to him, but who knows to think from the end. He is indifferent to mere reasonable probability and confident that through continuous imagination, his assumptions will harden into fact. How, but how to persuade men everywhere that thinking from the end is the only living? How to foster it in every action of man? How to reveal it how to reveal as the plenitude of life and not the compensation of the disappointed, that is a problem. Life is a controllable thing. You can experience what you please once you realize you are his son and that you are what you are by the virtue of your state of consciousness from which you think and view the world. Chapter 3, Highways of the Inner World. Genesis 25, 22, 23. And the children struggled within her. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb. In two matter of people it shall be separated from thy bowels, and that one people shall be stronger than the other people, and that the elder shall serve the younger. Duality is inherent condition of life. Everything that exists is double. Man is a dual creature with contrary principles embedded in his nature. They are war within and present attitudes to which life are agnostic. This conflict is the internal enterprise, the war in heaven the never-ending struggle of the younger or inner man of imagination, to exert the supremacy over the elder or outer man of the sense. Matthew 19.30, The first shall be last, and the last shall be first. John 1.27, He it is who coming after me is preferred before me. 1 Corinthians 15.47, The second man is the Lord from heaven. There are two distinct centers of thought or outlooks on which the world possessed by every man. The Bible speaks of two outlooks as natural and spirit. 1 Corinthians 2.14 The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritual discerned. 
Man's inner body is as real as the world of subjective experience as his outer physical body is as real to the world of external realities. But the inner body expresses a more fundamental part of the reality. This existent inner body of man must be consciously exercised and directed. The inner world of thought and feeling to which the inner body is attuned as its real structure and exists in its own higher space. There are two kinds of movement, one that is according to the inner body, another that is according to the outer body. The movement which is according to the inner body is casual, but the outer movement is under compulsion. The inner movement determines the outer which is joined to it, bringing out the outer movement that is similar to the actions of the inner body. Inner movement is the force by which all events are brought to pass. Outer movement is subject to the compulsion applied to it by the movement of the inner body. Whenever the actions of the inner body match the actions which the outer must take to appease desire, that desire will be realized. Construct mentally a drama which implies that your desire is realized and make it one that involves movement of the self. Immobilize your outer physical self. Act precisely as though you were going to take a nap and start the predetermined action in the imagination. A vivid representation of the action is in the beginning of that action. Then, as you are falling asleep, consciously imagine yourself into that scene. The length of the sleep is not important. A short nap is sufficient. But carrying the action into sleep thickens fancy into fact. A vivid representation of action is in the beginning of that action. Then, as you are falling asleep, consciously imagine yourself into the scene. The length of the sleep is not important. A short nap is sufficient. But carrying the action into sleep thickens fancy into fact. At first, your thoughts may feel like rambling sheep that have no shepherd. Don't despair. Should your attention stray 70 times, bring it back 70 times 7 to its predetermined course until from the sheer exhaustion it follows the appointed path. Their inner journey must never be without distraction. When you take to the inner road, it is to do what you did mentally before you started. You go to the prize you have already seen and accepted. Professor John Livingston Lowe says in The Road to Xanadu, but I have long had the feeling which this study had matured to a conviction. The fancy and imagination are not two powers at all, but one. The valid distinction which exists between them lies not in the material which they are operating, but in the degree of intensity of the operator's power itself. Working at high tension, the imaginative energy assimilates and transmutes. Keyed low, the same energy aggregates and yokes together those images which at its highest pitch emerges indissolubly into one. Fantasy assembles, imagination fuses. Here's a practical application of this theory. A year ago, a blind girl living in the city of San Francisco found herself confronted with a transportation problem. The rerouting of buses forced her to make three transfers between her home and her office. This lengthened her trip, for from, this lengthened her trip from 15 minutes to 2 hours and 15 minutes. She thought serious about this problem and came to the decision that a car was the solution. She knew that she could not drive a car but felt that she could be driven in one. Putting this theory to the test, quote, whenever the actions of the inner self correspond to the actions of the outer, physical self must take to appease the desire. That desire will be realized. She said to herself, I will sit here and imagine that I am being driven to my office. Sitting in her living room, she began to imagine herself seated in a car. She felt the rhythm of the motor. She imagined the smell of the odor of the gasoline. She felt the motion in the car towards the sleeve and the driver. She felt the motion of the car, touched the sleeve of the driver, and felt the driver was a man. She felt the car stopping and turning to her companion, said, thank you very much, sir. To which he replied, the pleasure is all mine. Then she stepped from the car and heard the door snap shut as she closed it. She told me that she told me that she centered her imagination on being in the car, and although blind, she viewed the city from her imaginary ride. She did not think of the ride. She thought of the ride and all that it applied. This controlled and subjectively directed proposed ride raised her imagination to her full potency. She kept her purpose ever before her, knowing there was a cohesive inner movement. In these mental journeys, an emotional continuity must be sustained, the emotion of the fulfilled desire. 
Expectancy and desire were so intensely joined that they passed at once from the mental state to the physical act. The inner self must be fired and is best fired by the thought of the great deeds and the personal gain. We must take pleasure in our actions. On two successful on two successive days, the blind girl took her imaginary ride, giving it all the joy and the sensory vividness of the reality. A few hours after her second imaginary ride, a friend told her a story of the evening paper. It was a story of a man who was interested in the blind. The blind girl phoned him and stated her problem. The very next day on his way home, he stopped in a bar, and while there, he had the urge to tell the story of the blind girl to his friend, the proprietor. A total stranger on hearing the story volunteered to drive the blonde girl home every day. The man who told the story then said, if you take her home, I will take her to work. This was over a year ago, and since that day, this blonde girl has been driven to and from work to her office by these two gentlemen. Now, instead of spending two hours and 15 minutes on three buses, she is in her office in less than 15 minutes. And on that first ride to her office, she turned to the Good Samaritan and said, Thank you very much, sir. And he replied, the pleasure is all mine. Thus, the objects of her imagination were to her the realities of which the physical manifestation was only the witness. The determinative imaginative principle was the imaginative ride. Her triumph could only be surprised only to those who did not know of her inner ride. She mentally viewed the world from this imaginative ride with which a clearness of vision that every aspect of the city attained identity. These inner movements not only produce corresponding outer movements, this is the law which operates beneath all physical appearances. He who practices these exercises of biblication will develop unusual powers of concentration and tranquility, and will inevitably achieve walking consciousness on the inner and dimensional larger world. Actu her actualizing strongly, she fulfilled her desire for viewing the city from the feeling of her wish fulfilled. She matched that state of desire and granted that to herself, which sleeping men ask of God. To realize your desire, an action must start in your imagination, apart from the evidence of the senses. Involving movement of self and implying fulfillment of your desire. Whenever it is an action which the outer self takes to appease that desire, the desire will be realized. The movement of every visible object is caused not by things outside the body, but the things within it which operate from within outward. The journey is in yourself. The travel along the highways of the inner world, without the inner movement, it is impossible to bring forth anything. The inner action is introverted sensation. If you will construct mentally a drama which implies that you have to realize your objective, then close your eyes and drop your thoughts inward, centering your imagination all the while in the predetermined action and partake in that action. Your inner action orders all things according to the nature of itself. Go and try it and see whether a desirable action once formulated is possible. For only by this process of experiment can you realize your potentialities. It is thus that the creative principle is being realized. So the clue to purposeful living is to center your imagination in the action and the feeling of the fulfilled desire with such awareness and sensitivity that you initiate and experience movement upon the inner world. Ideas only act if they are felt and if they awaken inner movement. Inner movement is conditioned by self-motivation, outer movement by compulsion. Joshua 1.3 Whatever the sole of your foot shall tread, the same I give unto you. Zephaniah 3.17 And remember, the Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. Chapter 4 The Pruning Shears of Revision 1 Corinthians 15, 47. The second man is the Lord from heaven. Never will he say caterpillars. He'll say there's a lot of butterflies as it is to be on our cabbage. He won't say it's winter. He'll say summer's sleeping. The very first act of correction or cure is to always revise. One must start with oneself. It is one's attitude that must be changed. Emerson, what we are that only we can see. It is a most healthy and productive exercise to daily relive the day as you wish you had lived it, revising the scene to make them conform to your ideals. For instance, suppose today's mail brought you disappointing news. Revise the letter. Mentally rewrite it and make it conform to the news that you wish you had received. Then in imagination, read the revised letter over and over again. 
This is the essence of revision, and revision is the result in repeal. The one requisite is to arouse your attention in a way in such intensity that you become wholly absorbed in the revised action. In doing so, you will experience an expansion and refinement of these senses by the imaginative exercise and eventually achieve vision. But always remember that the ultimate purpose of this exercise is to create in you the spirit of Jesus, which is the continual forgiveness of sin. Revision is of greatest importance when the motive is to change oneself, when there is a sincere desire to be something different, when the longing is to awake the ideal spirit of forgiveness. Without imagination, man, without this imagination, man remains of being in sin. Man either goes forth to imagination or remains imprisoned by his senses. To go forward to imagination is to forgive. Forgiveness is the life of imagination. The art of living is the art of forgiving. Forgiveness is, in fact, experiencing in imagination the revised version of the day, experiencing in your imagination what you wish had experienced in the flesh. Every time one really forgives, that is, every time one relives the event as it should have been lived, one is born again. Father, forgive them is not a plea that comes once a year, but the opportunity that comes every day. The idea of forgiving is a daily possibility. And if it is sincerely done, it will lift man to a higher and higher levels of being. He will experience a daily Easter, and Easter is the idea of rising transformed. And it should be almost a continual process. Freedom and forgiveness are dissolubly linked. Not to forgive is to be at war with ourselves, for we are freed according to our capacity to forgive. Luke 6, 37, forgiving you shall be forgiven. Forgive not merely for the sense of duty or forgive. Proverbs 3, 17, thy ways are ways of peasantness and all thy paths are peace. Forgive not merely out of sense of duty or service, forgive because you want to. You must take pleasure in revision. You can forgive others effectively only when you have the sincere desire to identify them with their ideal. Duty has no momentum. Forgiveness is a matter of deliberately withdrawing attention from the unrevised day and giving it full strength and joyously revising it. If a man begins to revise even a little bit of the annoyances and trouble throughout the day, he begins to work practically on the self. Every revision is a victory over himself and therefore a victory over his enemy. Matthew 10.36 A man's foes are those on his household, and his household is his state of mind. He changes his future as he revises his day. When a man practices the art of forgiveness of revision, however factual the scene of which the sight that rests, he revises it with imagination and gazes upon one never before witnessed. When someone forgives and revises it, they use their imagination to see something in a new way. This can lead to significant changes in how things are perceived, which might seem unlikely to someone who sees only what's in front of them. The story of the prodigal son is a good example of this. The battle man fights is fought in his own imagination. The man who does not revise his day has lost the vision of that fight. The battle that man fights is fought in his own imagination. The man who does not revise his day has lost the vision of that life, into the likeness of which is the true labor of the Spirit of Jesus to transform his life. Matthew 7, 12. Do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. In everything then, do to others as you would like to them to do to you. In everything, then do to others as you would like them to do to you, for this is the essence of the law and the prophets. Here is the way an artist friend forgave herself and was set free from pain, annoyance, and unfriendliness. Knowing that nothing but knowing that nothing but forgetfulness and forgiveness will bring us to new values, she cast herself upon her new image and escaped from the prison of her senses. She writes, Thursday, I taught all day in art school. She writes, Thursday, I taught all day in art school. Only one small thing marred my day. Coming into my afternoon classroom, I discovered the janitor had left all the chairs on top of the desk after cleaning the floor. As I lifted a chair down, it slipped from my graph and struck me, sharp blow to the incept of my right foot. I immediately examined my thoughts and found that I had criticized the man for not doing his job properly. Since he had lost his helper, I realized he probably felt he had done more than enough, and it was an unwanted gift that had bounced and hit me on the foot. Looking down at my foot, I saw both my skin and nylons were intact, so I forgot the whole thing. That night, after I'd been working intensely for about three hours on a drawing, I decided to make myself a cup of coffee. 
To my utter amazement, I couldn't manage my right foot at all, and it was giving out out of great bumps of pain. I hopped over to the chair and took off the slipper and looked at it. My entire foot was strange purple pink, swelling out of shape and red hot. I tried walking on it, and I just found that it just flopped. I had no control over it whatsoever. It looked like one, one or two things had happened. Either I cracked the bone, or when I dropped the chair on it, something could have been dislocated. No use to speculate what it, what it is. No use to speculate what it is. Better get rid of it right away. So I became quiet, all ready to melt myself into the light. To complete my bewilderment, my imagination refused to cooperate. It just said no. This sort of things often this sort of thing often happens when I'm painting. I just started to argue why not. It just kept saying no. Finally I gave up and said, You know what? I am in pain. And I'm trying hard not to be frightened. But you are the boss. What do you want me to do? The answer, go to bed and review the day's events. So I said, all right, but let me tell you that my foot isn't perfect by tomorrow morning. You have only to blame yourself. After arranging my bedclothes so that they didn't touch my foot, I started to review the day. It was slow going, and I had difficult keeping my attention away from my foot. I went through the whole day, saw nothing to add to the chair incident. But when I reached there early evening, I found myself coming face to face with a man who, for the past year, has made it a point of not speaking. The first time this happened, I thought he had grown deaf. I had known him since school days, but we had never done more than say hello and a comment from the weather. Mutual friends assured me that I had done nothing, that he said that he never liked me, and I finally decided it was not worthwhile speaking. I had said hi. He had an answer. I found that thought. Poor guy. What a hard state to be in. I shall do something about this ridiculous state of affairs. So in my imagination, I stopped right there and redid the scene. I said hi. He answered hi, and I smiled. I now thought, good old Ed. I ran the scene over a couple. I ran the scene over a couple times and went. I ran the scene over a couple times and went on to the next incident and finished the day. The now what do we do? My foot or the concert? I had been melting and wrapping up a wonderful present of courage and success for a friend who was making her debut the following day, and I had been looking forward to giving it to her tonight. My imagination sounded a bit solemn as it said, let us do the concert, it will be more fun. But first, couldn't we take my perfectly good imagination foot? But first, couldn't we just take my perfectly good imagination foot out of the physical one before we started? I pleaded, by all means. That done, I had a lovely time at the concert. My friend got tremendous ovation. By now, I was very, very sleepy and fell asleep doing my project. The next morning, as I was putting on my slipper, I suddenly had a quick memory picture of withdrawing my discolored foot and swollen foot from the same slipper. I took my foot out and looked at it. It was perfectly normal in every respect. There was a tiny pink spot on the instep where I remember it had hit the chair. What a vivid dream that was, I thought, and dressed. While waiting for my coffee, I wandered over to the drafting table and saw that all the brushes were lying helter-skelter and unwashed. Whatever possessed you to leave your brushes like that? Don't you remember it was because of your foot? So it hadn't been a dream at all, but a beautiful healing. She had won by art revision, what she had never had won by force. In heaven, the only art of living is forgetting and forgiven. We should take our life, not as it appears to be, but from the vision of this artist, from the vision of the world made perfect that is buried under all minds, buried and waiting for us to revise the day. Quote from William Blake, we are led to believe a lie when we see it not through the eye. A revision of the day and what she held to be so stubborn was real and no longer so to her like the dream had quickly faded away. You can revise the day to please yourself, and by experiencing in imagination the revised speech and actions only modify the trend of your life's story, but turn all its discourse into harmonies. The one who discovers the secret of revision cannot do otherwise than to let himself be guided by love. Your effectiveness will increase with practice. Revision is the way by which right can find its appropriate might. Matthew 5.39 Resist not evil, for all passion conflicts result in an interchange of characteristics. James 4.17 To him that knoweth to do good 
and doeth not to him is sin. To know the truth, you must live the truth. And to live the truth, your inner actions must match the actions of your fulfilled desire. Expectancy and desire must become one. Your outer world is only actualized by inner movement. Through ignorance of the law of revision, those who take to warfare without it are perpetually defeated. Only concepts that idealize depict the truth. Your ideal of man in his truest self. It is because I firmly believe that whatever is most profoundly imaginative is, in reality, your idea of a person is their authentic self. I strongly believe that what is most imaginative is actually the most practical. Therefore, I urge you to live a life of imagination and to reflect on and personally apply the transcendent statement. Colossians 1.27 Christ is in you, the hope of glory. Don't blame, only resolve. It is not man in the earth at their loveliest, but you practice in the art of revision, make it a paradise. The evidence of truth can lie only in your experience of it. Try revising the day. It is to prune the shears of revision that we own our prime fruit. Chapter 5, The Coin of Heaven There's a firm persuasion that a thing is so. Make it so? And the prophet replied, all poets believe that it does. And in the age of imagination, this firm persuasion removed mountains. But not many are capable of a firm persuasion of anything. Romans 14.5 let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Persuasion is our inner effort of intense attention. To listen attentively as though you heard it is an invoke to activate. Listen attentively as though you heard it is to invoke to activate. By listening, you can hear what you want to hear and persuade those beyond the ranges of the outer ear. Speak it inwardly in your imagination only. Make your inner conversation match your fulfilled desire. What you desire to hear without, you must hear within. Embrace the without within and become one who only hears with what implies the fulfillment of his desires. Embrace the without within and become one who hears only that which implies the fulfillment of his desire. And all the external happenings in the world will become a bridge leading to the objective realization of your desire. Your inner speech is perpetually ridding all around you in happenings. Learn to relate these happenings into your inner speech, and you will become self-taught. Inner speech are those mental conversations you can carry on with yourself. They may be inaudible when you are awake because of the noise and distractions of the outer world of becoming, but they are quite audible in deep meditation and dream. But whether they are audible or inaudible, you are the author and fashion your world in their likeness. Daniel 2.29 Daniel 2.28 there is a God in heaven, and heaven is within you, that revealeth the secrets and maketh known to the king. What shall be in the latter days? Thy dream and thy vision upon the head, thy bed, are these. Inner speech from the premise of your fulfilled desires is a way to create an intelligible world for yourself. Observe your inner speech, for it is cause of a future action. Inner speech reveals the state of consciousness from which you view the world. Make your inner speech match your fulfilled desire, for your inner speech is manifested all around you in its happenings. The whole, mani the whole manifested world goes to show us that what we used to have made of the world, inner speech, an uncritical observation of our inner talking will reveal to us the ideas from which we view the world. Inner talking mirrors our imagination, and our imagination mirrors the state with which it is fused. If the state which we are fused is the cause of a phenomenon of our life, then we relive the burden, wondering what to do. For we have no alternative but to identify ourselves with our aim, and in so much as the state in which we identify mirrors itself in our inner speech, then to change the state which we are fused, we must first change our inner talking. It is our inner conversation which makes tomorrow's facts. Like our mind, our stomach is stimulated by changing experiences. Ephesians 4, 22 to 24, put off the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt, and be renewed by the spirit of your mind. Put on the new man, which is created in righteousness. Stop all the new mechanical negative inner talking and start a new positive construction inner speech from the premise of your fulfilled desire. Inner talking is the beginning, the sowing the seeds of future action. To determine the action, you must consciously initiate and control your inner talking. Construct a sentence which implies the fulfillment of your aim, such as, 
I have a large, steady, dependable income, consistent with integrity and mutual benefit, or I am happily married, I am wanted, I am contributing to the good of the world, and repeat such a sentence over and over until you are inwardly affected by it. Our inner speech represents, in various ways, the world that we live. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word. Quote from Edward Arnold, The Light of Asia. What you plant is what you harvest. Look at those fields over there. The sesame was sesame. The corn was corn. The silence and darkness were aware. This is how a person's destiny is created. Ends run true to origins. A quote from D.H. Lawrence. Those that go searching for love only manifest their lovelessness. And loveless never find love. Only the loving find love. And they never have to seek for it. Man attracts who he is. Man attracts who he is. The art of life is to sustain the feeling of the wish fulfilled and let things come to you, not to go after them or think they flee away. Observe your inner talking and remember your aim. Do they match? Does your inner talking match what you say audibly? Had you achieved your goal? The individual's inner speech and actions attract the conditions of their life. Through uncritical self-observation of your inner talking, you find where you are in your inner world. And where you are in your inner world is what you are in the outer world. You put on the new man wherever ideals and inner speech match. In this way alone can the new man be reborn. Inner talking matures in the dark. From the dark it issues into the light. The right inner speech is the speech that would be yours were you realize your ideal. In other words, it is the speech of your fulfilled desire. Exodus 3.14, I am that. There are two gifts which God bestowed upon man, alone, and no other mortal creature. The two are mind and speech, and the gift of mind and the gift of speech is equivalent to that of immortality. If a man uses these two gifts rightly, he shall differ in nothing from the immortals. And when he quits the body, mind and speech will be his guides, and by them he will be brought into the troop of the gods, and the souls will have attained the bliss. The circumstances and condition of life are outpictured, inner talking, solidified sound. Inner speech calls events into existence. In every event is the creative sound that is life and being. All that a man believes and consents to be true reveals itself in his inner speech. It is his word. It is his life. Try to know what you are saying in yourself at this moment, to what thoughts and feelings you are consenting. They will be perfectly woven into your tapestry of life. To change your life, you must change your inner talking for life. To change your life, you must change your inner talking for life. Hermes quote is the union of word and mind. Unquote. When your imagination matches your inner speech to fulfill desire, there will then be a straight path in yourself from without it. And you will know the reality is only actualized inner talking. James 1 21 receive with meekness the inborn word which it is able to save your soul every man's stage of progress is made by the conscious exercise of his imagination matching his inner speech to fulfill desire because man does not perfectly match them the results are uncertain which they might be perfectly certain persistence assumption of what persistent assumption of a wish fulfilled is the meaning of fulfilling the intention as we control our inner talking, matching it to our fulfilled desire, we can lay aside all the other processes. Then we simply act by clear imagination and intention. We imagine the wish fulfilled and carry on our mental conversation from that premise. Through controlled inner talking from premises of fulfilled desire, seeming miracles are performed. The future becomes the present and reveals itself in our inner speech. To be held by the inner speech of the fulfilled desire is to safely be anchored in life. Our lives may seem to be broken by events, but they are never broken so long as we retain the inner speech of our fulfilled desire. All happiness depends on the active voluntary use of imagination to construct and inwardly affirm that we are what we want to be. We match ourselves to our ideals by constantly remembering our aim and identifying ourselves with it. We fuse our aim by frequently occupying the feeling of the wish fulfilled. It is the frequency the habitual occupancy that is the secret to success. 
the more often we do it, the more natural it is. Fancy assembles, continuous imagination fuses. It is possible to resolve every situation by the proper use of imagination. Our task is to get the sentence right. The one which replies that our desires are realized and fire the imagination within it. All this intimately connects with the mystery of this still small voice. Inner talking reveals the activities of imagination, activities which are the causes of the circumstances of life. As a rule, man is totally unaware of his inner talking and therefore sees himself not as cause but as the victim of circumstance. To consciously create circumstance, man must consciously direct his inner speech, matching the still small voice to his fulfilled desires. Romans 4, 17, he calls things not seen as though they were. Right inner speech is essential. It is the greatest of the arts. It is the way out of limitation into freedom. Ignorance of this art has made the world a battlefield of penitentiary where blood and sweat alone are expected when it should be a place of marveling and wondering. Right inner talking is the first step to becoming what you want to be. Speech is an image of the mind, and mind is the image of God. Hermetic Scott Translation On the morning of April 12, 1953, my wife was awakened by the sound of a great voice of authority speaking within her and saying, You must stop spending your thoughts, time, and money. Everything in this life must be invested. To spend is to waste, to squander, to lay out without return. To invest is to lay out for the purpose for which a profit is expected. This revolution of my wife is the importance of the moment. This is about the transformation of the moment. What we desire does not lie in the future, but in ourselves at this very moment. At any moment in our lives, we are faced with the infinite choice, what we are and what we want to be. And what we want to be already exists, but to realize it, we must match our inner speech to our actions. If two of you agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. Matthew eighteen nineteen. It is only what is done that now that it is only what is done now that counts. The present moment does not recede into the past. It advances into the future to confront us, to spend and invest. Thought is the coin of heaven. Money is the earthly symbol. Every moment must be invested in our inner talking reveals whether we are investing or spending. Be more interested in what you are inwardly saying now than what you have said by choosing wisely what you think and what you feel now. Anytime we feel misunderstood, misused, neglected, suspicious, afraid, we are spending our thoughts and wasting our time. Whenever we assume the feeling of being what we, we cannot abandon the moment of negative inner talking and expect to retain command of life. Before us go the result of all that is seamlessly behind us. Not gone is the last moment, but on coming. My word shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing where I said it. The circumstance of life are the muffled utterances of the inner talking that made them, the word made visible. The word is son, and the mind is the father of the word. They are not separate from one another, for life is the union of word and mind. He willed us forth from himself by the word of the truth. James 1.18 Ephesians 5.1 Let us be imitators of God as dear child. Second Samuel 23.2 And use our inner speech wisely to mold an outer world in harmony with our ideal. The Lord, the Spirit of the Lord spoke through me. His word was on my tongue. The mouth of God, the mouth of God is the mind of man. Feed God only the best. The present moment is always precisely right for an investment, to inwardly speak the right word. The word is very near to you, in your mouth and in your heart, that you do it. See, I have set before you the life in good death and evil blessings and spirits. Deuteronomy 30, 14, 15, and 19. Like is known to like alone. You choose life and good and blessings by being what you choose. Like is known to like alone. Make your inner speech bless and give good reports. Man's ignorance of the future is the result of his ignorance of his inner talking. His inner talking mirrors his imagination. 
and his imagination is a government in which the opposition never comes into power. If a reader asks, what if, if a reader asks, what if the inner speech remains subjective and is unable to find out an object for its love? The answer is, it will not remain subjective for the very simple reason that inner speech is always objectifying itself. What frustrates and festers and becomes the disease that afflicts humanity is man's ignorance of the art of matching inner words to the fulfilled desire. Alter your inner speech and change your perspective. The world changes. Whenever inner speech and desire are in conflict, inner speech invariably wins. Because inner speech objectifies itself, it is easy to see that if it matches the desire, the desire will be objectively realized. Were it not so, James 3, 6, And the tongue is a fire, and world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, standing the whole body, setting afire the entire course of life. It's set by the fire of hell. Chapter 6, It is Within William Blake, Jerusalem Rivers, mountains, cities, villages, all are human. And when you enter into the bosom, you walk into heaven and earth as in your own bosom you bear your own heaven and earth. And all you behold appears without, it is within, in your imagination, of which is the world, of mortality is but a shadow. Luke 17, 21, the kingdom of heaven is within you. The inner world was as real to William Blake as the outer land of his waking life. He looked upon his dreams and visions as the realities of the forms of nature. Blake reduced everything to the bedrock of his own consciousness. The real man, the imaginative man, has invested the outer world with all of its properties. The apparent reality of the outer world, which is so hard to dissolve, is only proof of the absolute reality of the inner world of his own imagination. John 6, 4, 4, For no one can come to me unless the Father who has sent me draws them to me, and at last I will rise upon them. John ten thirty. I and my Father are one. The world which is described from observation is a manifestation of the mental activity of the observer. When man discovers that his world is his own mental activity made visible, that no man can come onto him except he draws him, and that there is no one to change but himself, his own imaginative self, his first impulse is to shape the world in the image of his own ideal. But his ideal is not so easily incarnated. In that moment, when he ceases to conform to the external discipline, he must impose upon himself a far more rigorous discipline, the discipline upon which the self-realization of his ideal depends. Imagination is not entirely limited or confined, and it's free to move at will without any rules to constrain it. In fact, the contrary is true. Imagination travels according to the habit. Imagination has choice, but it chooses according to habit. Awake or sleep, man's imagination is constrained to the follow on certain defined patterns. It is this benumbing influence of habit that man must change. If he does not, his dreams will fade under the paralysis of custom. Imagination, which is Christ in man, is not subject to the necessity to produce only what is which is perfect and good. It exercises the absolute freedom from necessity by endowing the outer physical self with free will to choose to follow good or evil, order or disorder. Joshua 24, 15. Choose this day whom ye will serve, though after the choice is made and accepted so that it forms the individual's habitual consciousness, then imagination manifests its infinite power and wisdom by molding the outer senses world of becoming into the image of the habitual inner speech and actions of the individual. To realize his ideal, man must first change the pattern which his imagination has followed. Habitual thought is indicative of character. The way to change the outer world is to make the inner speech and action match the outer speech and action of the fulfilled desire. Our ideals are weighted to be incarnated. But unless we ourselves match our inner speech and action to the speech of our action of our fulfilled desire, they're incapable of birth. Inner speech and action are channels of God's action. He cannot respond to the prayer unless these paths are offered. The outer behavior of man is mechanical. It is subject to the compulsion applied to the behavior of the inner self. And old habits of the inner self hang until replaced by new ones. It is a particularly property of the second or inner man 
that he gives the outer self something similar to do in its own reality of being. Any change in the behavior of the inner self will result in the corresponding outer changes. The mystic calls a change of consciousness death. By death he means not the destruction of imagination and the state with which it is fused, but the dissolution. Fusion is union rather than oneness. Thus the conditions to which the union gave being vanish. Paul said in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15.31, I die daily. There is nothing like death. Death is the best thing that can happen in life. But most people die so late and take such an unmerciful time in dying. God knows their neighbors never see them rise from the dead. To the outer man of sense, who knows nothing of the inner man of being, this is sheer nonsense. When man has the sense of Christ as his imagination, he sees why Christ must die and rise again, from the dead to save the man, why he must detach his imagination from the present state and match it to a higher concept of his self, and if he would rise above his present limitations, thereby saving himself. Last week writes the one, who rose from the dead. A friend offered me her home in the mountains for the Christmas holiday, as she said she might go east. She said that she would let me know this week. We had a very pleasant conversation, and I mentioned you and your teachings in connection with the discussions of Dunning's experience with Todd, which she had been reading. Her letter arrived Monday, and as I picked it up, I had a sense of depression. However, when I read it, she said I could have the house and told me where to find the keys. Instead of being cheerful, I grew still more depressed, so much so that I decided that there must have been something between the lines which I was getting intuitively. I unfolded the letter and read it from the first page throughout, and as I turned to the second page, I noticed she had written a proscript on the back of the sheet first. It consisted of an extremely blunt and heavy-handed description of the unloved trait in my character, which I had struggled for for years to overcome, and for the past two years I thought I had succeeded. Yet here was again, described with clinical exactitude. I was stunned and desolated. I thought to myself, what is this letter trying to tell me in the first place? She invited me to use her house as she has been seeing myself in some loving home during the holidays. In the second place, nothing comes to me except I draw it. And thirdly, I have not been hearing anything but good news. So the obvious conclusion is that something in me corresponded to this letter, and no matter what it looks like, is it good news? I reread the letter, and as I did, I asked, what is it here for me to see? And then as I read, I saw the letter started out. After our conversation last week, a great feeling of elation swept over me. It was all in the past. The thing I had labored so long to correct was done. I suddenly realized that my friend was a witness to my resurrection. I whirled around the studio chanting, it's all in the past, it's done, thank you, it is done. I gathered all my gratitude up in a big ball of light and shot it straight to you. Now, instead of writing a polite letter because it is the correct thing to do, I can write giving sincere thanks for her frankness. Thank you so much for teaching, which has made my beloved imagination truly my savior. And now, if any man shall say unto her, Lo, here is Christ, or there. Matthew twenty four twenty three, She will believe it not, for she knows that the kingdom of God is within her, and that she herself must assume full responsibility for the incarnation of her ideal and nothing but death and resurrection will bring her into it. She has found her savior, her beloved imagination, forever expanded in the bosom of God. There is only one reality, and that is Christ, human imagination, the inheritance of final achievement of all of humanity. Ephesians 4, 14, 15, that we, speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, Chapter 7, Creation is Finished, Ecclesiastics 3.15, I am the beginning and the end. There is nothing to come that has not been and is. A quote about William Lake, All possible human situations are as already made states. He saw every aspect, every plot and drama as already worked out as mere possibilities. As long as we are not in them, but as overpowering realities when we are in them. He described these state He described these states as sculptures of lost halls. 
Distinguish, therefore, states from individuals into those states. States change, but individuals' identities never change nor cease. The imagination is not a state, said Blake. It is the human existence itself. Affection or love becomes a state when divided from imagination. Just how important this is to remember is almost as important to say, but the moment that an individual realizes this for the first time is the most monumentous in his life, and to be encouraged to feel this in its highest form of encouragement it is possible to give. The truth is common to all men, but only consciousness of it, and much more the self-consciousness of it. It is another matter. The day I realize this great truth that everything in the world is a manifestation of mental activity which goes without me. In the conditions and circumstances of my life only reflect the state of consciousness with which I am fused. This is the most momentous in my life. The experience that has brought me to this certainty is so remote from ordinary existence. I have long hesitated to tell it. For my reason refused to admit to the conclusion, but the experience that brought me to the certainty is so remote from ordinary existence. I have long hesitated to tell it. For my reason refused to admit the conclusion to which the experience impelled me. Nevertheless, this experience revealed to me that I am supreme within my own circle of my own state of consciousness, and that this state with which I am identified determines what I experience. Therefore, it should be shared with all, for to know this is to become free from the world's greatest tyranny, the belief in a second cause. Matthew 5, 8, Bless are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are those whose imaginations has been purged of the beliefs in the second causes. They know that imagination is all, and all is imagination. One day I quietly slipped from my apartment in New York City into some remote yesteryears countryside. As I entered the dining room of a large inn, I became fully conscious. I knew that my physical body was immobilized on my bed back in New York. Yet here I was awake and conscious as I've ever been. I intuitively knew that if I could stop the activity of my mind, everything would before me freeze. No sooner was the thought born, I felt my head tighten. I felt my head tighten, then thinking to stillness, my attention concentrated into a crystal clear focus. And the waitress walking, walking not. And I looked through the window, and the leaves falling, fell not. And the family of four eating ate not, and the lifting of the food lifted not. Then my attention relaxed, the tightness eased, and all of a sudden all moved onward into the course. And then my attention relaxed, the tighten eased, and all of a sudden all moved onward in their course. The leaves fell, the waitress walked, and the family ate. I understood Blake's vision from the sculptures of Lyle's Hall. John 4.38 I have simply... I have sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Creation is finished. The world of creation is finished, and its original is within us. We saw it before we set forth, and since having been trying to remember it and to activate sections of it, there are infinite views of it. Our task is to get it right. Our task is to get the right view and by determining direction of our attention, make it pass to the procession before the inner eye. If we assemble the right sequence and experience it in imagination until that has the tone of reality, then we consciously create circumstances. This inner procession is the activity of, a, this inner procession is the activity of imagination that must be consciously directed. We, by a series of mental transformation, become aware of increasing portions of that which already is, and by matching our own mental activity to the portion of creation which we desire to experience. We activate it, we resurrect it, and we give it life. This experience of mind not only shows the world as a manifestation of the mental activity of the individual observer, but it also reveals our course of time as it jumps of attention between eternal moments. An infinite abyss separates any two moments of ours. We by the movements of our attention give life. Think of the world as containing an infinite number of states of consciousness from which it can be viewed. In, think of the world as containing infinite number of states of consciousness from where it can be viewed. 
Think of these states as rooms or mansions in the house of God. And like rooms of any house, they are fixed relative to one another. But think of yourself, the real self, the imaginative you, as the living, moving occupant of God's house. Each room contains some lost scriptures with infinite plots and dramas and situations already worked out, but not activated. They are activated as soon as human imagination enters and fuses with them. With each represents certain mental and emotional activities. These enter To enter a state, man must consent to the ideas and feelings which it represents. These states represent an infinite number of possible mental transformations which a man can experience. To move into another state or mansion necessitates a change of belief. All that you could ever desire, all that you could ever desire is already present and only awaits to be matched by your belief. But it must be matched for it is the necessary condition by which alone it can be activated and objectified. Matching the beliefs of a state is the seeking that finds, the knocking to which it is open, to ask that receives, go in and possess the land. The moment man matches belief of any state, he fuses with it, and this union results in the activation of projection of these plots, plans, dramas, and situations. It becomes the individual's home from which he views the world. It is his workshop, and if observant, he will see the outer reality shaping itself upon this model of imagination. It is for the purpose of training us in image-making that we were made subject to the limitations of the senses and clothed in bodies of flesh. It is the awakening of imagination, the returning of his son, that our father waits for. The, the creature was made subject to vanity, not willing, but by reason of him whom subjected it. The final chapter, chapter 8, The Apple of God's Eye, Matthew twenty-two forty-two. What ye of the Christ, whose son is he? Matthew twenty-two forty-two. What do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? The son of David, they replied. When this question is asked of you, let your answer be, Christ is my imagination. The birth of Christ is the awakening of the inner or second man. It is becoming conscious of mental activity within oneself which activities continue whether we are conscious of it or not. The birth of Christ does not bring any person from a distance or make anything to be that was not there before. It is an unveiling of the Son of God in man. This great mystery begins with a vet and is appropriated that the cleansing of the temple. The coming is from within and not from without, as Christ is in us. In parentheses, four Bible verses. Romans 8.10 But if Christ is in you, Although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. 2 Corinthians 13.3 Since you seek proof that Christ is speaking in me, he is not weak in dealing with you, but is powerful among you. Galatians 2.20 I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who lived in me and gave himself for me. Galatians 4.19, My children, for I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. Colossians 1.27, To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, Christ in you, the hope of glory. 1 Timothy 3.16, God was manifest in the flesh. Luke 17.21, The kingdom of heaven is within you. This great mystery stands in the forefront of Christian mysteries. Advent is availing the mystery of your being. If you will practice this art of revision by a life lived according to the wise, imaginative use of your inner speech and inner actions in confidence that the conscious use of the power worketh in us. Christ will awake in you if you believe it, trust it, and accept it. 1 Timothy 3.16 Great is the mystery God was manifested in the flesh. We were subjected to this biological experience because no one can know of imagination who has not been subjected to the vanities and limitations of its flesh, who has not experimented and tasted this cup of experience. And confusion will continue until man awakes and fundamentally imaginative view of life has been reestablished and acknowledged as basic. Ephesians 3, 8, 9, I should preach the unsearchable riches of Christ and make all men see what it is, the fellowship of mystery. Bear in mind that Christ is in you, is in your Bear in mind that Christ is in your imagination. 
as the appearance of the world is determined by the particular state by which we are fused, so we may determine our fate as individuals by fusing our imaginations with the ideal we seek to realize. On the distinction between the states of our consciousness, it depends the distinction between circumstances and the conditions of our life. A man who is free in his choice often cries out to be saved from the state of his choice. Choose wisely the state that you will serve. All states are lifeless until imagination fuses with them. Ephesians 5.13 All things, when they are emitted, are made manifested by light, for everything is made manifested is light. Matthew 5.14 And ye are the light of the world, by which those ideas to which you have consented are made manifest. Hold fast to your ideal. Nothing can take it from you but your imagination. Do not think from your ideal. Think from it. It is only the ideals from which you think that you are realized. Matthew 4.4 4, Man lives not by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The mouth of God is the mind of man. Become a drinker and an eater of the ideals that you wish to realize. Have a set definite aim or your mind will wander. In wandering, it eats every negative suggestion. If you live right mentally, everything else will be right. By a change of mental diet, you can alter the course of your observed events. But unless there is a change of mental diet, your personal history remains the same. You eliminate or darken the life by the ideas in which you consent. Nothing is more important to you than the ideas which you feed, and you feed on the ideas from which you think. If you find the world unchanged, it is a sure sign that you are wanting infidelity to the new mental diet which you neglect in order to condemn your environment. You are in need of a new sustained attitude. You can be anything you please if you make the conception habitual. For any idea which excludes all others from the field of attention discharges in the action. The ideas and moods which you constantly return define to the state which you are fused. Therefore, train yourself to occupy more frequently the feeling of your wish fulfilled. This is creative magic. It is the way to work towards fusion in the desire. If you would assume the feeling of your wish fulfilled more frequently, you would be a master of your fate. But unfortunately, you shut out your assumptions for all but occasional hour. Practice making real to yourself the feeling of wish fulfilled. After you assume the feeling of a wish fulfilled, do not close that experience as you would a book, but carry it like a fragrance odor. Instead of being completely forgotten, let it remain in the atmosphere, communicating its influence automatically to your actions and reaction. A mood often repeats. A mood often repeats, gains a momentum, and is hard to break or check. So be careful of your feelings you entertain. Habitual moods reveal the state within which you are fused. It is always possible to pass from thinking of the end you desire to thinking from the end. But the crucial matter is thinking from the end. For thinking from means unification or fusion with the idea, whereas thinking of the end, there is always subject and object, the thinking individual and the thinking thought. Remember, you must imagine yourself into the state that you wish to fulfill for your love for that state, and in doing so, live from it, and no more of it. You'll pass from thinking of it to thinking from it by sending your imagination to the feeling that you wish to fulfill. Thank you for listening to Awakened Imagination by Neville Goddard, read by Ibn Aviel in Centuries of Wisdom. Take care. I wish you very well on your journey. I wish you good things. Subscribe for more.